Good morning everybody and welcome back to the latest edition of the RDA Central West Business Breakfast Series. I'm really excited that you're able to join us this morning because today we're joined by another very high calibre guest. Um, a lot of uh, you might know our guest as the hard-working uh, former barrister, former member for Orange and now the Federal Member for Calair and Minister Assistant Minister for Trade, Minister for Regional Education and Decentralisation. Please join me in welcoming Andrew G. Hi folks, g'day Sam. Good to have you Andrew, I really appreciate you taking the time to join us this morning. Pleasure, great I know, to see you. I know it's a very busy time. Um, but look, Andrew, before we get into a couple of, uh, couple of questions and things that are happening um, in the federal sphere, a lot of members, as I said, a lot of our viewers will know you as the federal member for Calair. But do you mind giving us our viewers a little bit of background about your journey into public life and how you think that journey's helped you in your current role? Mm, well, I guess I've done a few things uh, in terms of uh, occupations before going into politics. And I think, I don't know, I, I think it helps in politics if you have had some, what I would call, real life experience. Um, people take different pathways into politics and everyone's journey into it is is different. But I think having that real life experience can be of benefit. So I started firstly in the law. Um, I worked for a judge for 12 months. That was my first job. And then I went overseas and started my own business for a while, came back, worked as a solicitor and then as a barrister, and then ultimately went into the law. And I think having a, a legal background does actually help because it, I found that in terms of going through the legislation and actually drafting legislation, it does give you a bit of experience in, in doing that. So for example, in my last parliamentary role when I was responsible for uh, Roads to Recovery, that, that particular program which funds local council road programs, I was reforming the program to make it more user friendly to local members and I wasn't getting the, the feedback that I needed from the public service in terms of the drafting of the regulations or the instrument. So I just did them myself and uh, yeah, I, I was very surprised when they accepted it and <laughs> it all went through. So that's an example of where your previous occupation can be of assistance. I've got to say life was a lot simpler in the law. You had the judge, opponent, client, so you kind of knew um, you know, where, where the potential hits were going to come from, but uh, in politics they can come from all sides and anywhere. So life was simpler back then, but it's also very rewarding doing this job. Yeah, absolutely. And it's probably a bit more black and white now. It's probably a lot more shades <laughs> of grey. But uh, look, and as you said, you did run your own business, mm. I believe, at one stage, yeah. and that probably um, has been a fantastic grounding to help you understand the, the challenges of the local business community. Yeah, and absolutely. now more than ever, they're un, uh, probably in very uncertain and challenging times. Um, what have you been hearing from small and local businesses across the electorate as they grapple with the evolving COVID scenario? Well, stress, anxiety, worry, there are some real stories of heartbreak. Some businesses have already closed and it's very hard to hear those stories and talk to the people who are involved in those closures, especially the young entrepreneurs who have just opened businesses and so full of promise and optimism and just to see it taken away like that is heartbreaking and our office here is just across the road from Centrelink so you see the queues there on a daily basis and it's a stark reminder um, that this stuff what we're doing um, has real consequences and there is a real need to help people out there in terms of the way the local business community is faring I mean it's it's mixed but it's very very difficult and very tough and I know it's taken a huge emotional toll on a lot of business owners because so many treat their staff like family mm -hmm. and to, to see these uh, employees uh, having to uh, you know, go on to job seek or job keeper is just heartbreaking. So it, it's, it's a very difficult time. I think a couple of the key points that businesses have raised with me, they've been very concerned about going into hibernation what happens with the wages and how they'll be able to retain staff. Well, I think JobKeeper has helped a lot. So over 900,000 businesses across Australia have accessed JobKeeper. So that has been a successful program in terms of the take-up rate and I'm, I'm having good feedback on it. 
The other thing that they've been concerned about, particularly for small businesses, has been the rentals mm. and what happens to your tenancies. And some landlords have been really, really good and accommodating. And so I think this new commercial code that's coming into effect will be very welcomed because it basically forces the parties to be reasonable and negotiate. And if they can't reach a concluded agreement, then they'll be forced to mediation. So I think having some certainty around the wages and also the tenancies has been really important for business owners, but you can't sugarcoat it. I mean, this is, mm. this is a, an awful situation and it's still going on and we've just got to help as many businesses uh, and livelihoods as we can to get through to the other side while taking care of the, the health issues as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's an unprecedented scenario that we find mm. ourselves in. And I guess um, it's just one small way that we can help support a local business. I stopped in and saw uh, Claire and Matt and the team at Anything Grows this morning. Great place to grab a coffee uh, if you can. If you can. Um, any support we can give to local business, and I think Andrew would probably agree, is absolutely vital right now. Yeah, because, thanks Claire and Matt. Because they're doing, they're doing it tough. But yeah, I guess... Are. That's probably a nice segue into my next question. Um, there's been a suite of stimulus measures announced by yep. both the state and the federal government. Um, you mentioned one, the job uh, job keeper package, yep. which I believe the legislation passed the House, um, the House and the Senate uh, last week, yep. and it was 130 billion dollars. It was one of the, I think, it was the biggest single spending bill in Australian history. Yep. Um, another thing that I think has been well received from the feedback that RDA Central West has been getting has been the cash flow for small business. Yep. Um, what kind of feedback around the stimulus measures have you received across your electorate and what could you foresee coming down the pipeline next? I think generally it's been well received and I think where there have been issues, I've seen genuine attempts from the government to kind of work through those issues and find a solution. And I think uh, you look, look, look at a suite of measures that are available. So obviously job seeker, but job keeper most importantly um, you've got the cash payments for businesses employing people. Uh, that's been very well received. You've got the, um, the guaranteed loans for small and medium-sized business enterprises, which I think are really important, and I know businesses have been accessing those. So I think that's been a good one. You've got the instant asset write-off threshold has been raised to $150,000. You've got further depreciation allowances as well to go with that. You've got subsidies for apprentices as mm -hmm. well. So there is a full suite of measures available for small and medium sized businesses out there. Most of our businesses around here fall into that category. So I think it has been very well received, but look, I don't think we can um, pretend that that's gonna be the total answer. And I, this has been so unprecedented that some businesses have already closed, as I've said, and that's the tragedy of all of this. So we're going to try to get as many businesses through to the other side. But the reality is not everyone is mm. going to get through. And, uh, you know, your heart just breaks when you hear those stories. And I've spoken to business people who've been in tears mm. um, over the, the situations that they're facing. And some sectors are obviously being hit more than others, particularly, for example, hospitality events, mm. tourism, travel. Construction is one that's, you know, really uh, education, higher education. Yeah, you're right. There was that initial phase of businesses that were impacted and now yep. it's starting to penetrate its way to those, those mm. secondary tier um, businesses. Mm. Uh, but I think what you said uh, just earlier is re a really important point. It's about um, through um, stimulus measures like the JobKeeper, it's about, it's also important to retain and keep those skills yep. in our region, yep. because if their jobs forego, there's a strong there's a strong chance that many of these skilled people may in fact leave uh, regional areas, and then when we do ramp back up in, in due course, then we could have a skills vacuum that we're left with in our region. So I think that's why it's probably been well received. And as you said, the stimulus, uh, the other stimulus measure, the, uh, the instant asset write-off, I think that's been well received by businesses that have been able to navigate their way through. But from feedback that we've received, I think a few of the smaller businesses, it's probably not their number one focus right now. Understandably, mm. uh, that was one of the first ones that was rolled out. And I think it's been a rolling, a rolling suite of measures. And as this has gone on, yes, the, the situation has changed very quickly and it has been unprecedented in the way that these policies have been formulated. I think you make a good point on the retraining. I think that is a, a key point. And I think we've got some good measures in place 
not only in business, for example, the apprentice and trainee subsidies, but also the courses that are available now through our higher education providers, including universities, so the cut price courses. Mm. I think TAFE is also offering free courses. And I'll just jump in there. That TAFE course information is on the RDA Central West website if you're interested. And I think you're right, Andrew, fantastic opportunity for people that might be looking to upskill or reskill. Um, fantastic resource at their disposal. It's not all doom and gloom, though, mm. Sam, in terms of regional Australia. And I think, it, heartbreaking though, we've seen these stories uh, be, I think there is hope. And I think out in country Australia and out here in particular, we still do have strengths which other parts of Australia may not. Number one is agriculture. Mm. So the strength of the economy in our nation's always been built on what we make and grow and what we sell. Agriculture is front and centre in that. We've still got mining. So mining is still going pretty well, um, both in terms of uh, gold and copper just up the road, uh, iron ore in, in other parts of Australia. Uh, so our, uh, our exports in terms of mining are still very strong. So there are about 5,000 people employed in mining directly, that's direct across the Central West. So we still have that arrow in our quiver. Uh, we've still got health, we've still got education, although higher education going to be taking a hit. So we still do have some economic strengths that other parts of Australia don't. Up in Oberon, we've got forestry, we've got food processing, particularly mm. around Bathurst and Blaney. So uh, we, we may be down, but we're certainly not out. And so if we can get through this, we will be able to rebuild perhaps even better than some other parts of the country is my feeling at the moment. Yeah, I tend to agree. I think we've got some fantastic competitive competitive advantages here in the Central West. Yep. You mentioned a couple of them earlier. Mining um, is a good foundation for us to build on and agriculture as well. Um, we've seen some positive recent rains. We're by no means out of the drought, but I've, I've been speaking to a lot of farmers, probably like yourself, Andrew, they've got a bit of a spring in their step. Yep. They're back. They're feeling good. They're optimistic about the future. And I think what you mentioned before is very true. There's, there's renewed confidence about the sector and about the year ahead. So hopefully, fingers crossed, that continues because, uh, as you said, that's definitely a pillar that we will be drawing on to keep pushing us through this, uh, this challenging time. But yep. it's probably, as I said, a good way to... Um, channel through to my next question. Um, there's a lot of stimulus measures and support measures that have been announced to date to support businesses and the community. Um, sometimes it can feel a little bit overwhelming if you're a small business. Where do I go for advice? Um, how do I navigate my way through these, these processes? Yeah. Um, in your opinion, where's the best place for an interested business or a community member to go if they're seeking advice? I think for business, business.gov.au is a great first stop. And I've had a look through that website and it does answer a lot of questions and direct you around what's available. But you can also go to the Treasury website as well. They've got some very good fact sheets. Some of those are posted on my Facebook page. The ATO is also a great source of information as well. And you can just call our office if, if you have any direct queries and we'll point you in the right direction as well. Yeah, absolutely. So after this chat this morning with Andrew, we'll make sure we put those links to the Treasury uh, website and the business.gov website up on our Facebook page. We'll also link in Andrew's electorate office contact details because he's, that's a fantastic resource there at your disposal as well. 6361 7138. Well, there you go. There's a plug. We're right still on, open. Right, right on cue. <laughs> Thank you very much. Look, um, we've mentioned about um, small business doing it tough. Yeah. Um, we've probably alluded to it a little bit, um, but what would be your message for community members that are wanting to support local business um, at the moment? What's the best way they can do that? Well, I think just try to shop local, spend local, and support our businesses when you can get out. And obviously, it's, it's really hard. I mean, this is, the, this is the issue, I think, with a lot of the stimulus. We're pumping money in, but it's not easy to stimulate an economy when you're forcing businesses to shut down mm. and also you're restricting people's movements. So there are some big challenges with all of this. So my message out there is support small business when and where you can and just remember that um, these are local uh, folks, local families um, that you're supporting. So please try to buy local. And there's a lot of online shopping, I think, mm. going on at the moment. And one thing you can do is if you, if you see a price and you think, oh, well, I can get it cheaper online, give your local business a call and say, look, I can get this online, are you able to match the price? And nine times out of 10, they'll be able to do it. So I think that's really important to, to shop local and just keep talking to uh, your local business people and just let them know that you appreciate them. 
And some of those frontline businesses, for example, pharmacies, especially in the early days of this coronavirus crisis, were really copying it from people who didn't understand the need to be, uh, for pharmacists, for example, to be uh, uh, cautious in terms of the medicines they were able to dispense. There were regulations and rules around mm -hmm. it. And some of them copped a bit of abuse, um, also in our supermarkets. Just be mindful that we're all in this together. And so just to support our businesses, both with your wallets, but also with a kind word here or there, it, it certainly uh, would help. Yeah, I think that's a, a great point. And uh, I think if you've got the capacity to stop, shop and spend locally, now more than ever, yeah. it's, it's, it's absolutely vital. There's some fantastic local online offerings there if you're interested. And I think what you mentioned just before about um, sense of community supporting each other. I think that's really come to the fore because um, I think it's testament to the Australian spirit. When you test it, people seem to get around each other and um, I, I think that's definitely um, been the case. And I think uh, the way state, local and federal government have worked together through this crisis, I think has been well received by the community as well. Yeah, um, I, th I think that's right, Sam. I think we have seen the Federation working a lot better than it does at times with those different tiers of governments. and. Country communities in particular, what we do in the good times, but particularly in the bad times, is we stick together and we look after each other. We pass the hat around. Mm, and mm. so, for example, we're running Calair Community Care from this office, whereby we work with our service clubs and offer a check-in service for vulnerable members of the community who just need a phone call every couple of days. So, and, and this is happening all over the region. So. We've always done that in the bush and we'll continue to do it. And it's just a, uh, it's something that I think just comes naturally to country communities. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, what you mentioned is very true. Um, those vulnerable people out there, if you've got the opportunity to c call a friend, call a family member that you haven't touched base with yeah. recently, probably now more than ever, that's absolutely important. Um, we're all welded to our laptops and our mobile phones right now, but a lot of our aged people in our community, they're probably not um, as connected as, as we are, yeah. and as, as Andrew said, maybe taking five minutes to give them a call this morning and say good day and check in, see how they're going is absolutely important. And a lot of them have been in lockdown also for well over a month now. And so, uh, you know, in, in, in cases where people might have an underlying medical condition, and my dad's in that position, he doesn't live in this region, but he's basically been in lockdown, or he, as he calls it, house arrest now for over four weeks and so no family members are even going inside when family members visit they're out on the veranda and they're talking through the screen door it's really hard and uh, you know it's it, it takes its toll so reach out to someone if you can if they're not a family member it might be just someone that you know someone in a community group but i really think they'd appreciate it and it, it, now more than ever that really does count for a lot yeah. just just being there for someone yeah, absolutely. And we might even put on our Facebook page the uh, Calair Community Connect information yep. that Andrew is operating through his office. So um, we'll put that up after this chat this morning. Might just change pace a little bit here if we can. This next segment I like to call Fast Five. It's where we hit our special guest with a couple of questions to, to dig a little bit deeper, to learn a little bit about, a little bit about what makes them tick. So I'll start with uh, a nice one. It's a bit of a loaded question. Yeah. But what's your favourite place to grab a coffee across the Calair Electorate? Oh, Sam, I have so many. <laughs> I move around the electorate a lot, although not at the moment, I have to mm. say. I'm usually chalking up a lot of country miles in the car. Look, I have so many. It just depends where I am on a given day. And I, have, I don't have one particular one in one particular town. But I don't know, for example, if I'm going through Wattle Flat, it's the Wattle Flat General Store, and I've got stops like that all over the region. But one thing we do have out here is great coffee. And so, you know, if you're... Uh, once these travel restrictions are lifted, you know you can tell tell people in Sydney and wherever if you, whoever's looking at this, we've got great coffee out here in the Central West. Doesn't matter where you are, you come out here and grab a great coffee on top of your holiday or whatever else you're doing. And if you not need some good coffee beans, Bill's Beans, I think they're doing online and delivery, so check that out as well. Great way to support a local business. Um, favorite holiday destination? Oh, Sam, I like surfing. I have to say, and so. I'm not saying I'm a terribly good surfer, but I do like surfing. So anywhere where there is a break, but in particular, I would have to say uh, the North Coast, there are some great breaks up there, which I'm very fond of. 
So the word on the street is that we might see you at the uh, the back of the break at Yamba, potentially, <laughs> uh, in Christmas holidays. I'm a bit, a bit more of a land mammal myself, but uh, if you're holidaying up on the north coast uh, in the near future, you might see the federal member for Calaire on the uh, in the wetsuit and on his surfboard out the back. So. <laughs> we can't advertise the breaks. People get upset when you advertise the breaks, but uh, I'd say north coast breaks. I've got a couple down on the south coast that I'm pretty keen on. Oh, you want well. to keep those quiet today? Yeah, I'm not going to mention specifics, <laughs> yeah, but hey... Surfers know where they are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, top band or album? I'm a big country music fan, Sam. I love country music. So is my wife. She's uh, a really? massive Luke Bryan fan. Oh, really? See, my wife, Tina, does not share my passion for country music. But at the moment, I'd have to say I'm listening to Lee Koenigan. Okay. Bit of back road nation action going on. But I also, you know... Uh, I, I love Tim McGraw. Um, I'm a big Tim McGraw fan. We've got some other great Aussie country artists like Amber Lawrence, Jasmine Ray, uh, the list goes on. So any type of country music uh, I'm a big fan of. And I actually just watched a lockdown documentary on Netflix on Dolly Parton, which was absolutely fascinating. Now there's a country legend for you. Absolutely, and she's done a lot in the early childhood literacy space, mm. and I think it's probably in that documentary. Uh, fantastic, if, you haven't, if you're interested, check out Dolly Parton. Um, I can't recall the name, Early Childhood Literacy, and it's, abs it's an inspiring story. My dad's always been a great Dolly Parton fan. As has mine, so <laughs> we've, we've got that in common. Uh, mine, I'm uh, a big Powderfinger fan. Powderfinger, yeah, okay. Always have right. been, and I said it last week, Vulture Street, All classic right. album, one of my favourites. Um, Rock and roll. Yeah. Uh, Proud. Oh, look, who, who's, who doesn't like ACDC? If you're Australian, you've got to like ACDC. Uh, a bit, bit of cold chisel, you know, got a chunk. Yeah, anyway, we could, I've got a long list, but... Uh, no, look, we've got some classic Australian music and uh, if you've got an opportunity to download a, an Aussie hit right now, it's probably a good time while you're at home working from home or the kids are at home, good yeah. time to listen to a classic Aussie song. Um, next question, uh, two-pronged two -pronged approach, proudest achievement in politics yep. and biggest failure or biggest missed opportunity perhaps? Hmm. Well, I guess the we've had some, over the years, we've had some big you have to call them fights, I think, to get some of those those really the bigger ticket items uh, that have really brought the communities together to get behind. I guess my first one was Golgong Hospital. Golgong Hospital closed in 2010, and trying to get the new hospital uh, once we got into government proved more challenging than I thought it would. So Golgong Hospital would have been the first one, but on top of that, you'd have the 24 hour rescue helicopter service, which was a massive one. And I think we got from memory over 30,000 signatures on a petition for that. The linear accelerator or the radiotherapy machine, um, the second one here at Orange was a big one and not as easy as we thought we had to fight for that one as well. Um, we've got some big road projects up and running. So the highway, um, the Fairbridge bends between Orange and Molong was another big one that we fought hard for. The uh, funding for um, the Yulin Road w was a big one. Yulin and Cope Roads out uh, Maji Golgong Way um, saved lives. So that was, that was a pretty big one as well. I guess um, if you look in the, the federal sphere, the Charles Sturt University Medical School was just massive. Mm -hmm. And because it just seemed like we had the world against us, on that one it was a bit you know i look back on it now and i think well Golgong hospital and some of these other ones uh, the 24-hour helicopter service were were great training grounds because you'd think this stuff would be easy but it's not easy and you can you can also get resistance from your own side of politics so the medical school was was a big one dixon's long point um is another big one but it's not always on oh, mount panorama the money for the second racetrack um that's going to be a game changer when it comes in. So we've had some some good big ticket wins, but we've also had a lot of smaller ones as well that mean just as much to people in the community out there. So um, I, I particularly enjoy those ones where people say, you're never going to get this. You, you, people have been trying for years, you won't get it done. And that medical school one in particular, we had, uh, we had every medical organisation in the country against us every city university um, against us. We had 
doctors lining up, we had the medical student associations, um, you name it. So, yeah, so that they're, they're the big ticket ones, uh, I guess, but there are also a lot of uh, smaller ticket items which have made a real difference to people's lives. And I guess, and what lessons do you think you've learned going through that Murray-Darling Medical School process? Because for those that don't know, that's going to deliver, I believe, end-to-end -end medical school in Orange. Yeah. 37 places uh, that open 2021, I yeah. believe. Um, fantastic resource for our region. Uh, but what lessons did you learn as a, uh, the local MP, I guess, trying to, to advocate for this? And what do you think the long-term benefits will be for not just Orange, but the Central West? Yeah, well, the, the medical school one was a good one, but I guess all of those big ticket items have one thing in common. That if you want something badly enough, you just have to really be persistent in dealing with governments. And also, sometimes you're going to hit ministers and even prime ministers who don't support or don't think that they can support your project for, for example, political reasons. So, for example, with the medical school... Uh, Look, I don't think Malcolm was was able to get behind it because they were worried um, um, about you know the medical politics and the AMA and the people opposing it. I think firstly you've got to really be persistent and you've got to have the passion to drive it through. And I guess the other thing that also helps a lot is if the community is behind you. And in all of those projects which I've just mentioned, that save lives or will transform lives. The community's always been behind them and supported them. And I think once you get the momentum behind you, it, it can be hard to stop in dealing with governments. And even though barriers and walls get placed in front of you, you've just got to find a way around them. So, for example, when we were trying to get the 24-hour the helicopter up and running, there, it just seemed one obstacle after another. And they had a review. It's like, OK, so that's another hoop that we've got to jump through. So what do we do with that? Okay, well, we put a submission together and um, we make contact with the reviewers and state our case and we meet with them. And so you've just got to be persistent and consistent in dealing with governments. You've got to have the passion to get it done, but also the community support. So with the medical school, for example, the support was all local. Everyone else was against it, but we had great local support from local councils. Local government was supportive groups like the CWA, we had local doctors, and a number of other key organisations who were very much local um, in their organisational structures, but who were right behind us, and together we got it done. And it just goes to show you that if you, if you want something badly enough and you get the support, then you can get these things done. And long after my time in politics is done, that medical school will be churning out the, the doctors of country Australia for generations and it'll just get bigger. And so I think that is, even though, I, you know, it's, it's easy to be cynical about politics and I've been in politics for long enough to know that it does have a very ugly side. Like there is no doubt about it. I've, I've seen the worst of people in politics, but you can, you can get things done and change lives in politics. And that's, that's the upside of politics and that's that's why I do it because here you have, for example, a new medical school which will train the country workforce for the future but ultimately it will be a benefit to country people. So you'll have more GPs in country areas trained for country practice. So it will, it will make lives better and that's ultimately what politics has got to be all about. That's why we're here and I think sometimes th there's so much politics in politics that you can lose sight of it like you know the politics of politics is atrocious like there's backstabbing and people trying to take each other down I've, I've seen it all I can tell you stories that'll make your hair curl maybe that's for believe. next week maybe that's for next week I couldn't do it I couldn't do it on air uh, I'd probably be sued but <laughs> that's the, the bad side of politics but the upside is that it can transform people's lives once you're all working together as a community and that medical school is a great example but Galgong Hospital you know long after we've departed the earth Galgong Hospital will still be going and hopefully that road will, will be even bigger and better between uh, Mudgee and Orange Dixon's Long Point so you can get things done and make a difference to people's lives that's what I have learnt um, in this political <laughs> the journey that I've been on. And I guess it's just a good general lesson for life about perseverance and persistence. You've got to, you've got to plug away to, if it's something my dad always told me, anything worth 
uh, having your life is worth fighting for. Yeah, and you will always have setbacks, I mm. think. Like, in life, you're always going to have setbacks and have curveballs thrown at you, but you've just got to dust yourself off and just keep going. And, in, you know, in politics, I've... You know, I've uh, I've had my share of setbacks um, in politics. I've had um, leaders who weren't supportive of what I was trying to achieve in terms of local projects who weren't on board. I've had to deal with ministers who are sometimes downright hostile to what we were trying to do. I mean, you know, uh, some those big projects I've just spoken about in health. I mean, the, you know, Galgong Hospital, I, you know, I, I think if all things being equal, you know, the, the, you know, the government of the day, which is our government, they probably would have been happy just to have it as a health one and not as, a, as a, an NPS in a hospital, but that's not good enough. So you can get things done, um, and when you hit a brick wall, you've just got to find a way through to go over it or around it or crash straight through it. Now, that's a good point, and I think uh, with the, the Murray-Darling Medical School, that's the studies show that if you're trained in a regional area, you're more likely to stay in a regional yeah, area. I think the long-term long benefit of... Uh, this medical school will have those high level skills and expertise based across the Central West, which I think is a, is, is a big win. And I guess that's probably a nice segue into my next question. Yeah. Um, I, I, I recall when you were the state member when Electrolux closed yeah. locally here in Orange, there was a big push for reskilling staff to help yeah. uh, make them employable in the future. Yeah. Do you think that's something, especially we've been talking about health at length, maybe in the yeah. health and aged care space, that um, the government could focus on going forward to support um, those workers who might have been out of work now as part of the uh, COVID scenario? Yeah, I look back on that time, the, that time of Electrolux, and it was another devastating time. That was a big blow for this area and Australian manufacturing, generally Australia's last fridge-making plant, profitable fridge-making plant, I should have closed. But we, we did, working together, um, we were able to put in a very successful retraining program and the Electrolux um, were very supportive of that as well. And that, that was a successful aspect to a quite a tragic situation. And it did succeed in keeping a lot of people in this area. Yeah, it was a huge retraining program. And I think that's something that our area can be very proud of. And a lot of local businesses were very supportive of it and took people on who had retrained and reskilled. And I think at the moment, we're still in crisis mode, mm. but we're moving in, we will move into recovery. And quite frankly, the sooner we get into recovery, the better, because I don't think six months is sustainable with this lockdown. And I think we've got to be looking at ways of, if we can, subject to the medical advice, mm. we've got to be looking at ways of getting this economy back open and people employed again and businesses up and running. Because at the end of the day, it's going to be um, the business sector which leads the way. Government can't do everything, and it's the businesses who employ people and pay tax. They take the risk, mm. and so the recovery is going to be a huge, a huge task in itself. I think you rightly point out that retraining is going to be a very important part of it. It won't be the only part, but I think locally here it will be an important part because, um, yeah, we've got a. a it's, it's going to be a big task. I was going to say it's not an impossible task and it's something that we do have some experience in as you rightly point out yeah absolutely and i guess um as i mentioned before that looking to to support those workers as they're accessing potential potential new opportunities and yep. i think you mentioned with electrolux one of the former workers there i think owns and operates the baby bunting in store here in orange yep. and i had a chat to him about that i think craig was his name also if you need some good baby products uh, as a new father that's where i go um so you can help another way to support a local business. Uh, but look, I just wanted to finish on a, a, a bit of a slight change change of tact. Mm. Um, I know we've spoken a lot about health in yeah. today's, this morning's conversation, and a lot of uh, our viewers this morning may, may not know that you yourself were actually diagnosed with melanoma in 2010, mm. and I can imagine this was a confronting and challenging time. Um, what did you learn going through that process or that experience, and I guess, um, what advice would you give to our viewers this morning about staying on top of their own health? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, well, anyone who gets that news never forgets it. I remember the day that I got that news, um, that was, uh, it was a devastating, it was devastating news. And uh, the weekend after I got it was 
you go through all of the worst case scenarios. I had stage three melanoma and so I'd been pre-selected for the state seat of orange at this point and was just gearing up for the, the state election um, in, in the following year, which was in March. So I got, it was, look, it was purely by chance that I was so lucky that I, I picked it up. So do you want to know the story? Yeah, go for, yeah I think our viewers would as well. I think it's... So I, I, I went, I was invited down to, uh, Russell Turner was the state member at that point and he had uh, an assistant working for him called uh, Bev. Bev Glover would be well known to people. And Bev said, come down for homemade sausage rolls. And I said, oh, look, I'm really busy. I don't know if I can do it. And she said, no, no, come down. You know, the sausage rolls are really good. So I went down there. I, I don't actually think Russell was there at that point. So anyway, I had the sausage rolls talking out in the courtyard. And I was just standing there with my hand on my hips. I just kind of had my thumb in my belt, just kind of talking. And I just noticed there was a lump there. And I didn't know what it was. And it turned out to be a, a lymph node. And uh, that's where the cancer was. One thing led to another. Um, I went down and had the, uh, an operation to remove the lymph nodes in, in my groin um, not too long after that. And I think that it was, uh, you go through different stages of that. And obviously there's the shock of the diagnosis and then um, it's just processing the information uh, and dealing with it. And then coming out of it, that I think is when you start to reflect on what the wider meaning of it is and, and the impact that it has on your life. And, and at that point, um, they said, look, you're at stage three um, and there's a 50-50 chance of it coming back, which would mean it goes to stage four. And I, I, you know, I was trying to, I was sort of trying to get an answer that I thought would be good in terms of what the odds are. I was hoping for maybe 10%, you know, that would be good. And I said, so, um, what, what are my chances? And they said, well, it's 50-50. You've got a 50-50 chance of it coming back. And I said, well, what happens if it comes back? And they said, well, look, if it comes back, there's, there's not much we can do because at that point, 10 years ago, there was just nothing to treat melanoma with. So I was pretty, I was a bit, and I, I remember saying to the, uh, the professor who was treating me at the time, it was uh, Professor John Thompson, Prof, Prof Thompson, I said, oh, you know, but I'm young, that must improve my odds. He went, nah, still 50-50. I said, but you've got it reasonably early. He said, nah, still 50-50. I went, okay. And I was a bit depressed about that to begin with. And then I spoke to my sister, who's a doctor, and I said, oh, you know, I just got it. It's 50-50. And she said, I said, look, that, that's, that's a toss of the coin. That's not great odds. And she said, well, what do you mean that's not great odds? I mean, there are plenty of people out there who get, you know, worse odds than that. And People are, many people have been through the cancer in one form or another and she said you just got to go out there and live life and and make sure you do everything that you can to stay on the right side of the ledger and, and do everything that you can to stay in the right 50% and so that's what I've done and I, as I, I went on a drug trial which the, the drug was ultimately unsuccessful but I think it helped the research uh, so I was on that for four, about four years I think um, but it does change, it changed the way that I looked at politics and the way that I went about um, my advocacy and that my, my advocacy took on a, a greater urgency. And I, I remember there was a colleague that I worked with at the bar who was uh, building a construction. He was a barrister and he got melanoma and he passed away. And I remember, um, you know, before he passed away, he got... Um, I think they injected Teflon in, into his throat so he could say goodbye to his family. I mean, that's, and that, and I just thought, wow, I mean, we are here in uh, such a, a, a you know, blink of an eye um, are our lives and it can just be taken away like that. So I thought that just added a whole new level of urgency to what we were doing. And at, when he passed away, just before we were, um, trying to get the radiotherapy machine here at Orange. And we were getting resistance from our own government to the extent that they wouldn't even let us do press conferences on the hospital um, ground. <laughs> so um, we were doing press conferences with uh, our local community members uh, like uh, John Carpenter and Stuart Porges. We, were, we worked out where the dividing line was between um, the Western Care Lodge and the hospital. And we were doing the, the press conferences on the, the lodge side of things. But I just thought, now nah, we're, we're here for such a short period of time. If, if we're going for this stuff, we've just got to go and just punch through. And so that, 
that kind of has driven my approach to a lot of this stuff and including the medical school like there's no tomorrow with this stuff like if we're here and we have the opportunity and we do in government then you just got to go for it and even if you tread on a few toes and get a few noses out of joint and you know lord knows we've probably done a, a bit of that in terms of you know even people on our own side of politics that weren't fully supportive we just got to go through them because you know life is short our time here is short and you just got to get things done it's a gift being in a position like this you've got to make it count and the other thing I guess that it has um, it, it has taught me was that I don't sweat the small stuff as much as I used to. Like it gives you a greater perspective. And so you see the political games of Macquarie Street or even Canberra and it, it just didn't worry me after a while. You just kind of look at it and go, yeah, whatever. It just doesn't mean anything. And so, you know, the jockeying over positions, I mean, okay, it's good to have a position, but... You know, at the end of the day, no one really cares what position you've got in politics. So much time and energy is spent in that. And I'm, I mean, I've got a position, I've got a ministry now, which is great because hopefully we'll be able to get some things done with it. But at the end of the day, no one's going to remember really what, what you were or what your title was. But they will remember the things, I think, that you get done for the community. That And I've listed quite a few already. That's what polit That's the essence of politics is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I think, and I actually think that's a great way to, to wrap up today's conversation because um, I'm glad you've got a, a clean bill of health now, Andrew, as yeah. I'm sure all our, our viewers are. So we've got to look after ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it probably gives our viewers a great insight into your passion and advocacy for health, resourcing and support yeah, in our region worry. with your personal um, journey that you've been on. Um, but I think it's a great way to finish and make us all um, just stop and reflect and about persevering, um, sticking, at our, sticking at our tasks and trying to contribute and make, make a bit of a difference. And I guess um, right now, more than ever, our community is doing it tough. And it probably brings us back to one of the first points we made in our conversation this morning, that if you've got the opportunity to, to support your local community, uh, contact a family member, a friend, or even a neighbor to check in to make sure they're going okay, I think now more than ever, that's absolutely vital. Absolutely. So look, Andrew, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for joining us so with us for the RDA Central West Business Breakfast Series this morning. I hope everyone that's joined us has got a little bit out of today's conversation, learnt a little bit more about their federal member, uh, learnt a little bit more about what uh, the local priorities and uh, project focuses are going forward. I hope you have a fantastic Friday, a great weekend, and join us next Friday as I sit down with Caddy Marshall, the General Manager of Orange 360, um, for our next edition. Thanks a lot and have a great day. See you folks.